Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're having a great time at our Article One initiative event entitled Restoring Article I. Uh, our ambitious plan is still to have Congress fully and completely restored by the end of the day. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society, and I'm particularly excited to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker, Senator Mike Lee. Senator Lee graduated from Brigham, Brigham Young University with a degree in political science. He also graduated from BYU's law school, where he served as president of the Federalist Society student chapter back in the day. He went on to clerk for Judge D. Benson, District Court in Utah, and then for Judge Sam Alito, then on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Senator Lee spent several years in private practice with Sidley and Austin, where he specialized in appellate and Supreme Court litigation. He then served as assistant U.S. attorney in Salt Lake City. By 2005, he was serving as general counsel with Utah Governor John Huntsman. And next, he clerked again, this time for Justice Alito. Today, as the junior senator from Utah, he's also, among other things, a member of the Judiciary Committee and chairman of the Antitrust, Competition Policy, and Consumer Rights Subcommittee, protecting business competition and personal freedom. Since his tenure began in the 114th Congress, he's also served as chairman of the Senate Steering Committee. So we see he served in state and federal government and within the federal government in all three branches. Perhaps most importantly for our perspective today, Senator Lee is the driving force behind his own Article I project in the Senate. According to that project's website, Congress is, and here I quote from that project's website, endowed with the power to legislate, tax, spend, and oversee the weaker executive and judicial branches, while simultaneously held to tighter public accountability. Congress was meant to be the driving force in federal policymaking. Close quote. So Congress, its power spelled out in Article I, enjoys pride of place in the Constitution, and if the executive and judicial, judicial branches are the weaker branches, Congress is, of course, the strongest. But we've heard a lot here today that suggests Congress might not be the strongest branch, or at least not exercising its powers maximally, as anticipated in Federalist 51, in a manner that strikes the balance of power. So I'm anxious to hear Senator Lee's views on these and other important matters. So please join me in welcoming Senator Mike Lee. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It was an, uh, <clears throat> a thrill for me as I walked in here to hear James Walner's voice. Uh, James Walner is a trusted uh, former staffer of mine, uh, someone whose voice I came to recognize as one that would always steer me in the right direction and in the direction of understanding the nature of the United States Senate and how human nature interacts with the rules, the history, and the, the customs of the Senate. One thing that did, Dean didn't mention in introducing me is that I come from a very large family. Uh, I'm one of seven children, which in Utah is sort of a smallish family. I mean, I only have three kids. <clears throat> I only have three kids, but uh, my parents had seven. In Utah, that's practically a sign of infertility. Uh, but uh, as a member of a large family growing up, I, I learned quickly how group discussions often happen or, or fail to happen, how siblings interact with each other. And there's a, a lot of truth to what James is describing in terms of the Senate's failure to act, sometimes when you fail to open the release valve uh, for debate and discussion that needs to be held. Sometimes when you hold back uh, uh, for too long the ability of members to introduce ideas that they have and amendments, that can cause other problems. In many cases, that culminates in the Senate, uh, for its part, or Congress as a whole, not acting at all. That's why I'm so glad to be uh, coming here to talk uh, uh, about the need to restore Article I and the power of Congress. Article I, of course, is the section of the Constitution that outlines the powers that Congress has. Now, I think it's no coincidence whatsoever that this comes first in the Constitution. The very first clause of the first section of the first article of the Constitution says, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. All legislative powers, leg legislative powers are the power to make law. Laws are, are norms that are enforceable by government. And so if it's going to be setting policy for the federal government and backed up by the overpowering force that is the federal government, uh, 
it must be put in place in the first instance by Congress, and there is no other way. The Founding Fathers therefore intended the Congress to be first among equals, first among the three co-equal branches of government, and gave Congress really almost all of the most dangerous powers, uh, in, including taxing and spending, uh, declaring war, and, um, and trade, which is a subject that I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today. Uh, my, my macro thesis for this, and the reason why I started my own Article I project in the Congress a couple of years ago, is because of the fact that we have seen Congress delegate away uh, many of its primary powers. Uh, I, I, I noticed it first, I started tracking the problem uh, with respect to uh, regulatory matters uh, back when I was in law school. So more than two decades ago, I started noticing that uh, compliance with federal regulations was costing the, Amer the American economy about $300 billion a year. Today, that number stands at $2 trillion a year. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that Congress often passes instead of laws, platitudes, saying we shall have good law in area X, and we hereby delegate to agency Y the power to promulgate and enforce uh, laws in that area. And that's not really law. That's delegating to someone else the power to make law, even though we ourselves are the only ones accountable. We do that for the specific reason that it helps us avoid accountability, and it's wrong. Since I've been here, I've discovered that the problem is much, much worse than I had previously imagined that it happens far more frequently than I had realized, and that it extends far beyond the regulatory sphere. That it, it also exists with respect to the war power, where under uh, White Houses, Houses of Representatives, and Senates of every conceivable partisan combination, we've seen congressional inaction uh, when it comes to declaring war. And uh, Congress will often sit idly by. And it exists to a very significant degree in trade policy. This is one of the things that we discovered when we started the Article I project a couple of years ago. We started scanning the horizon, looking for areas in which Congress has excessively delegated its power. And one of the in initial brain children of the Article I project uh, was uh, the Global Trade Accountability Act, uh, where we discovered uh, in more areas of the US code than I can count instances in which Congress has, had, had delegated away its power uh, to impose uh, tariffs and other trade restrictions to the executive branch, concentrating that power in the hands of one man. Uh, now, yes, it's, it's one man plus an army of uh, bureaucratic and other executive branch officials uh, and the lobbyists that, that surround those, but we have concentrated it in one branch nonetheless, one branch that is ultimately um, answerable to one person. As we approach this topic, I'm re reminded of a fascinating story from the LBJ administration. In December of 1963, uh, not long after uh, Lyndon B. Johnson became the president, President Johnson signed a presidential proclamation that imposed crushing tariffs on light trucks and a couple of other products from Europe. The move was taken in retaliation uh, against some other tariffs that the European economic uh, community had imposed on American broiler chickens, uh, which is why, to this very day, this particular series of uh, uh, tit-for-tat exchanges in the trade area is known as the chicken war. European tariffs on American goods uh, were, of course, the stated overt expressed reason for LBJ's action. But as was so often the case, and as is sometimes the case even to this day, he also had an unstated reason for his action as well. You see, the 1964 election was fast approaching. And it was rumored that the United Auto Workers would go on strike, uh, would go on strike right at the height of the campaign, at the worst possible time for LBJ. So when Johnson decided to retaliate against Europe for Europe's chicken tariffs, he threw the UAW a bone, a pretty significant bone, by slapping European automakers with a 25% tariff. Johnson got what he wanted out of this deal. Uh, he got a, a great special interest swap. Uh, 
And uh, as, as fate would have it, uh, the United Auto Workers Union stepped right into line and backed his candidacy during the campaign. But the consequences of this tariff were steep. Uh, certain models of Volkswagen cars all but disappeared from American roads, including the so-called Type 2 van, um, which is better known in popular American culture today as the, uh, the mystery machine from the Scooby-Doo cartoon series. Uh, that's the only way I can get my kids interested in this, is by pointing out comparisons to popular cartoons, especially Scooby-Doo. Uh, but even today, many decades after this chicken war, exercise, that the 25% tariff uh, on trucks remains in effect, causing headaches for foreign manufacturers and domestic manufacturers uh, alike. Uh, they, and this story illustrates some of the perils of giving unilateral power over trade decisions to a single branch of government, ultimately to a single individual. All it took was a well-timed phone call from union boss Walter Ruther to make this a reality and effectively to take the mystery machine off the market. There was no input from the American people. There was no robust debate and discussion with an amendment process within Congress. It was just a pen and a phone, to borrow a phrase from a recent president. That's all it took. The American people didn't really have the chance to say, wait, stop, maybe you should reconsider doing that. As you know, tariffs of this sort are not subjects of merely historical interest. These aren't just relics uh, that, that we can now forget about. Just two weeks ago, President Trump unilaterally imposed some fairly crushing tariffs on steel and aluminum imports, uh, citing national security reasons. Now, the president imposed these tariffs against the wishes of some of his close advisors and a number of, mem a, a number of members of Congress, myself included. Personally, I am very concerned that these tariffs are likely to kill far more good, solid American jobs than they will protect or preserve or ever hope to create. After all, steel mills employ approximately 140,000 people in America. Now, that's a lot of people. It pales in, in comparison uh, to the steel consuming industries that in America uh, make up about 6.5 million jobs. So uh, some of those American workers will surely lose their jobs when tariffs raise the prices of raw materials. I don't have to look uh, beyond my own state to see examples of this happening. I had in my office just yesterday a CEO from Utah, CEO of a company, a manufacturing company, that uses steel in its products. Uh, steel is very often not the largest uh, piece of each, uh, uh, each product they make, but it is very often the single most expensive, or at least one of the most expensive pieces they put in any finished product. As a result, this company that currently employs 2,000 people in my state might well end up having to outsource all of those jobs to another country as, as a result of the fact that this 25% increase on such a critical input that they use every day might make it impossible, economically infeasible, for them to continue to keep those jobs in Utah and inside the United States. But you don't have to oppose tariffs on policy grounds in order to see the flaws inherent in the process that led to their imposition here and in other cases. The present system simply vests too much power, immense power, awesome power, in one person. One person who is then empowered to raise tariffs or even in some cases pull the country out of a trade agreement uh, without so much uh, as a tweet to Congress. This one person, any person who occupies that office, can do that at any moment for almost any reason without having to have any additional discussion or debate. Now, this is the exact opposite, the polar 180 degree opposite of what our founding fathers had in mind and, and what they, in fact, prescribed with their words. They wrote 
in the Constitution that Congress is supposed to take the lead on issues of trade policy, that Congress owns this issue. It could not be more clear, in fact, when you read the words of Article 1, Section 8, uh, that, that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. And Congress has the power to impose taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. It could not be more clear. Because the people had more influence over how they were governed, trade policy occupied a more prominent place in public discourse during the early days of the Republic uh, than it does today. Uh, and, and of course, it, it occupied a whole lot more of Congress's attention back when Congress had this bold idea that it was supposed to stick to those powers actually enumerated in the Constitution as federal. But that's federalism. That's an issue for a different time. I, I always maintain, though, that the genius of our system is based on the twin structural protections, the vertical protection we call federalism, and the horizontal protection we call separation of powers. Whenever a, we deviate from one, it accelerates and enables the deviation from the other. In other words, it is no, co no coincidence that at the very time we started drifting away from federalism during the New Deal era, we vested all this new power in the federal government. Congress all of a sudden found itself too busy to handle all the measly tax, tasks of actually legislating, and that's when the delegation frenzy began in earnest. The first major piece of legislation passed by the very first Congress was itself a trade bill, the Tariff Act of 1789. Most federal revenue during this time period, uh, during our founding era, came from tariffs and import duties, which helps us understand why the founders would have understood that it would be so important to give this power only to Congress, the branch of government most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. They didn't want to give the executive the power to impose what were, in effect, massive unilateral tax increases. I mean, those were the taxes of the day. At least the federal taxes of the day were, in fact, tariffs. And just as we today wouldn't uh, find it easy to even imagine a tax overhaul bill that would say, okay, with the income tax rate, it's going to be whatever the executive branch of government decides at any given moment that it's going to be. That would never happen. But the fact that that wouldn't happen today, uh, it doesn't mean that it's okay uh, for us to give to the executive branch the power to make adjustments in other areas, including tariffs. The system established by the founders was, of course, messy and raucous and difficult to predict, difficult for any one person or one group of people to control. And it was all of those things in, in the very best American tradition. This is exactly why they wanted it this way. They wanted it to be difficult, and that's why they vested it in Congress rather than in the executive. It required effort and it required risk on the part of lawmakers. They had to battle test their ideas during frequent debates, and then in the real world, once their ideas became law, they would have to face their constituents based on the consequences of those decisions. Failure was, of course, always an option, as Congress learned when it passed bad laws, like the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930. This is a law that uh, bears the name of one of my predecessors, uh, Reed Smoot, the senator from Utah. That was the Smoot in Smoot Hawley. And my grandfather, my mother's father, was a T-man, a Treasury Enforcement Officer. And he used to tell me in his later years when I was a child how much he felt a twinge of guilt over the fact that as a, a Treasury man, he helped enforce the Smoot Hawley Tariff Act, which he recognized played a significant role in contributing to, if not starting, a global depression. But over time, many politicians just became exasperated with the distribution of power and the division of labor outlined in the Constitution for some of these same reasons. That is the fact that it's messy, it's cumbersome, it's difficult, it's time consuming. It requires face-to-face -face interaction with constituents who might not be all that pleased about the failures of trade policies that we enact. <clears throat> 
It exposed them to the electoral consequences and pressure from special interests. So Congress decided to shift this burden to somewhere else. Starting during the Great Depression, Congress began to offload its responsibility, uh, along with a lot of other things, uh, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, started offloading uh, responsibility uh, with respect to trade policy uh, over to the executive. And the executive, of course, was uh, happy to accept that additional power. Before long, the executive branch had accumulated immense power to alter rather dramatically the flow of trade into, in our country. Uh, that is more or less the situation in which we find ourselves today. Law after law per, passed over uh, the course of many decades has given immense power to the executive branch uh, to do everything necessary to start a full-blown trade war in almost any part of the world. Now, I think it's time for Congress to shift the balance of power back in Congress's direction as the Constitution not only requires, but guarantees to the American people. Congress should do this for selfless reasons, but it can also do it for self-interested reasons. Congress is now, sadly, the most reviled institution in American life. And I don't think it's much of an exaggeration to describe it that way. It's, it's earned that reputation, a reputation that has its approval rating hovering uh, between 9 and 11 percent, which I think makes us uh, less popular than uh, infestations of fire ants. Uh, I mean, at least they serve an ecological purpose. <clears throat> it's earned Congress a reputation of cowardice and avoidance of responsibility, as it has unburdened itself of tough responsibilities over everything from tariffs to declarations of war to the making of regulatory policy. So in this process, Congress has left the people at the mercy of a president as well as a vast army of unelected, unaccountable, and uh, unforgiving bureaucrats within the administrative state. If Congress is ever going to restore its own status in the eyes of the people and to regain their trust, then it needs to stick up for them by wresting control back from the executive branch. That is the mission of the Article I project uh, that, that I started a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's the reason I introduced the Global Trade Accountability Act, which would help Congress restore its authority when it comes to trade policy. The bill would require congressional approval for any unilateral trade action undertaken by the executive branch. Uh, before raising any trade barriers, the president would have to submit uh, a report to Congress outlining the proposed change in question, its expected costs and benefits, and its duration. One way to think of it, if you're familiar with uh, some of the efforts going on in, in regulatory policy. This is the trade equivalent of the RAINS Act. The RAINS Act stands for Regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny, which requires for any new major, uh, if enacted into law, it would require any future major rule uh, adopted uh, by a regulatory agency to take effect only after it had uh, been affirmatively voted into law uh, by both houses of Congress and presented to the President. The Global Trade Accountability Act would of course have stopped President Trump's steel and aluminum tariffs had it been enacted in time. It still has not been enacted, but if, had we adopted this before the President's uh, announcement, then it would have stopped it. But you don't need to be a free trader to support that legislation. You don't have to agree with me on the policy merits of the thing in order to reach that conclusion. The Global Trade Accountability Act is agnostic as to the substance of trade policy. It says nothing about what kind of trade policy we should pursue, but it says a great deal about who gets a seat at the table, about who gets to have input into a decision about trade. Congress has shirked its responsibilities for a really long time. And I've witnessed the inertia of, uh, of, of the Senate and of the House of Representatives on countless occasions. That inertia can at times be all the, the more severe when the president happens to be of the same political party as the majority of Congress. Uh, but I know Congress 
can stand up for itself when it wants to. And I know that because it's done so in the past. In, in, in 1980, for example, during the waning days of his administration, President Carter imposed a dime per gallon import fee on gasoline. He justified this fee using the same authority, uh, Section 232, that was invoked by President Trump for the steel and aluminum tariffs. Like President Johnson before him, President Carter had a spoken reason, but also an unspoken reason for this tariff. The spoken reason was to conserve energy. This tariff was part of Carter's massively unpopular effort uh, to get Americans to drive less and put on a sweater. I was really young at the time he made that statement, but it still bothered me. Uh, I don't think I understood uh, as a kindergartner why it was so bothersome, but I, I, I found it irksome nonetheless. The, the unspoken reason was revenue. Carter was effectively proposing a new tax on American families that would bring in roughly $12.6 billion per year for the federal government, which was considered a lot of money in those days. What followed was a full-on revolt from Congress, a Congress that was led by members of his own political party. And, and this revolt was led not by leadership, but by rank-and-file members whose constituents were calling by the thousands to register their aggressive opposition. Not just against the stupid wear a sweater comment, but against the tariff imposed pursuant to Section 232, which was hitting them and their bottom line. Liberals like Howard Metzenbaum and conservatives like Jesse Helms united to pass a bill that killed President Carter's gas tariff. And then President Carter vetoed it, and then Congress overrode his veto, ultimately by a vote of 335 to 34 in the House and 68 to 10 in the Senate. It was the first time since 1952 that this had happened, meaning that Congress had overridden a veto executed by uh, a member of the majority party. Stories such as this give me hope that Congress can, in fact, rediscover and reassert its constitutional role in trade policy, and indeed, hopefully, in many other areas as well. Politicians like myself were not elected to come here and to avoid tough fights. We were elected, in fact, to seek them out, to have them. If you do not like fires, don't be a firefighter. If you don't want to make tough decisions on questions of policy, do not run for legislative office. Those fights will be easier to win if we can think proactively about how to reclaim our power well before the next tariff scare, where before the next moment for decision making has, ar has uh, arrived. And, and that means passing important reform legislation like the Global Trade Accountability Act and continuing uh, valuable discussions like the one that we're having today. So thank you again to the Federalist Society. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for letting me come and visit. The, the senator does have time for a couple questions. If folks want to use the microphones to ask a question or two, he does have a few minutes, and we've got a little time in our schedule. Um, while we're waiting to see if folks line up, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, two things stuck out uh, to me uh, about your, your talk. One, that one institution's burdens are perceived by another institution, the executive, as a power. And I wonder if you want to say more about that. Why is it that something the president, the executive, would see as, as a power to be gained, uh, Congress sees as a burden? to be uh, given, uh, given away. Uh, th that's point number one. Point number two is your, your uh, we, we talked a lot about incentives in our Article One project, and, and I was struck by the idea that Congress is in its own self-interest to do better. Uh, given the the uh, public approval ratings of Congress. Um, and I, I've seen the single digit numbers. Uh, I've also seen some figures that I indicate that individual congressmen are, and, and senators are well liked by their constituents within their own district, within their own state. Um, and the retention uh, and, and incumbency you know, 
indicates the same. So I wonder if you could say more about uh, the differences there between the institution, the perception of the institution versus individual congressmen and what, what that means. Great questions, both of them. On, on the first point, I think some of it has to do with the fact that um, it's easy for Congress to delegate, particularly in the case of regulatory policy, the power to a, a nameless, faceless bureaucracy or to, a, to one of the many alphabet soup bureaus because there are several layers in the accountability chain there. Everyone has somebody else to blame it on. When bad things happen, when we uh, delegate the power uh, X to agency Y, and then something bad happens pursuant to that act, members of Congress can point to the executive branch and to that agency and say, aren't they barbarians? We beat our chest, we write angry letters as if that were our job. And that makes it easier. As to why the executive and the presidency in particular has been so willing and eager to take that on, I think the presidency has behaved much more in a Madisonian, in a Madisonian respect, this is how the Founding Fathers anticipated that every branch would act. Mm -hmm. it, it is easier to understand why a branch would accumulate power. Uh, it, it's easy for us to understand, for instance, um, some of the judicial activism that we see when the Supreme Court, or any court for that matter, extends its power, it is, when it oversteps its power, it's often doing so because it can become more powerful. Individuals tend to crave power. They tend to want more of it. So the presidency is acting in a way that Madison predicted. The, the, the part of uh, the, the three-branch structure that isn't behaving as Madison predicted right is Congress, right. which begs the question, why? What has made Congress different in that respect? I think it was anticipated that uh, members of Congress would continue to feel that instinct. And what has replaced that and offset it in the case of Congress is the drive for what, for lack of a better word, I'm going to refer to as perpetual incumbency. Right. You don't have that in the presidency. Term limits make that impossible, presidential term limits. But in Congress, you, you have people, um, you have a different dynamic where m members not being term limited very often want to stay for whatever reason for a very, very long period of time. And it becomes a whole lot easier to stay in power when you've got people coming to you and complaining to you to say, that, oh, that wasn't me. That was, that, was, uh, that was Timmy over there. Go talk to Timmy. And, you know, Timmy's a barbarian. How dare Timmy come out with that bad regulatory policy? It makes it easier to achieve perpetual incumbency. Your second question was about why, how, what can we do to make, make yeah. it in Congress's interest to do this again? Especially for individual congressmen and senators, yes. given the fact that they're beloved by their own. Right. The only way that that is going to happen is for uh, people all over the country to start expressing this to their individual members of Congress. Uh, and for the the excessive delegation problem to become part of our national political discourse. Now, before you laugh me out of the room for thinking that that is a possibility, I will tell you, I've been in this business uh, uh, now for, uh, I've been, in, I'm in my eighth year in the Senate. Uh, and during that time period in talking to not just grass tops, but also grassroots audiences, uh, town hall groups, um, just uh, or ordinary people, ordinary citizens, not lawyers or activists. Regulatory matters and issues uh, involving trade policy uh, come up with a lot more frequency in, in ordinary town hall audiences than they ever have before, because the heat has been turned up so much by the federal government that I think um, some members of Congress are starting to feel it, but we need a lot more of that pressure. That's the only way to do it, is to popularize the Article I discussion, which is why I'm so glad that you're, you're having this Article I project. Uh, Good afternoon, Senator Lee, Dennis Kirk. We've talked before about some of my favorite subjects like nominations, and Jim Walner mentioned Rule 19, where the uh, senior leaders in the Senate aren't holding them to the fire about standing up and uh, having to do the old Mr. Smith filibuster to get nominations through, just letting them slide. But I also believe that, you know, and we've talked about the 30-hour rule versus three-hour rule, and you mentioned uh, famously get them to stay on Friday night and they'll get something through. Have 
you know, and that was eight months ago we last talked about it. Has anything changed that uh, you see a better swelling for that, either one of those two options, because I see it's not done, or in the um, Mitch McConnell interests to hold people to their fire and make them debate? Thank you. That remains a struggle. Sadly, things have not changed significantly since we last spoke about that. Uh, what is happening is that the, um, with respect to many nominations, we're required to run the 30 hours. And um, I, it is my strong belief what he's referring to is that I've stated on previous occasions, if when the Democrats make us run the full time on each nominee, if they make us run 30 hours uh, post cloture before uh, the final confirmation vote, if we kept them in session weekend after weekend uh, when doing that, particularly in this election cycle where the map appears to be relatively favorable for Republicans and less so for Democrats, uh, they would, I think, quite quickly change their tune. Um, and I think they would quite quickly go a lot easier on nominees, many of whom, by the way, have come out of committee without much, if any, opposition, uh, but they're just wanting to run out the clock. I don't remember the, what the current count is, but it would take many years beyond the, the uh, 11 years to confirm all of the uh, nominees that are currently pending at the rate we're doing that. I think we could speed that up a lot by placing some consequence on those who just want to delay it. I think many of the problems that the Senate now faces uh, r relate to this issue. When, uh, when they want to run the 30-hour clock, we shouldn't make them stay. The Democrats won't put up for that uh, very long, and, and they will realize it's, it's not really in their interest to do that. So too with the legislative calendar. When they vote against cloture, they're voting not to close debate. If that's what they're voting for, let's have a debate. Let's refuse to close debate until such time as they choose to close debate. It's not actually true that it takes 60 votes to pass something into law in the Senate. And I'm not just talking about budget reconciliation. Any legislation uh, passes by a simple majority in the Senate, unless we're talking about a veto override or something where a different threshold is specified. The 60 vote threshold is only for closing debate. If they vote against closing debate, let's make them actually debate. Let's not just adjourn for the weekend or the week or for two weeks and reward them by letting them go and do whatever else they want to do. Let's make them stay and debate until they agree to close debate, and then we can get some things passed. Senator Lee, thank you so much.